thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, my name is Mike Lean. I'm speaking from um, my home in Scotland because that's all I can do from the time being, but to try and simulate um, the experience of speaking to my New Zealand friends, I brought a little friend with me. Here he is, um, and he's going to be my audience for this morning. I will move straight on to the slide sharing and put it onto full screen, and off we go. So, I'm going to tell you a story, and the story is, is a personal one. Um, from experience as a diabetes physician with a number of years of experience and also research training to look at this question of, of what is type 2 diabetes and what, what are we doing about it and what should we be doing about it and could we do any better. Um, the painting you'll recognize here, I'm a mountaineer, and uh, this is not a New Zealand mountain, although it's quite similar to some. Um, it's actually a painting by um, a man who uh, happened to who discover insulin. His name is in the bottom right, Fred Banting. He was a very third-rate doctor, very much worse scientist, but happened to be in the right place at the right time to meet a Scotsman called MacLeod, who apparently found, discovered insulin. But he was an extremely good oil painter. Um, and if any of you can track down any of his paintings, you'll be able to swap it for a house any day. Another painting of his, just some disclosures, the study I'm going to tell you about has uh, no commercial funding, no government funding. It's entirely funded by charity, by Diabetes UK. But I do have um, uh, research funding, and these from a number of countries here, companies. And I will also point out at the very beginning that the main slides from Direct are all posted on a website. It's www.directclinicaltrial.org.uk. So. What I don't need to tell you, but perhaps I do, is that type 2 diabetes is a very serious disease. Uh, and list here of its complications, which um, most of us are very familiar with, but put it all down. Are we telling our patients this? Are we actually telling the world that this is a really very, very serious disease um, with massive costs uh, to our, our healthcare services and to individuals? And to put this into a sort of bit more focus, I've listed here three common diseases with their 10-year survivals, their current 10-year survivals. Um, from Cancer Research UK website, you can see breast cancer has an 80% 10-year survival. Now, we would usually think of breast cancer as a serious diagnosis, something we need to treat and treat very seriously. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a rather worse cancer uh, with only 60% 10-year survival. If you're told you have breast cancer or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and you're offered chemotherapy for a remission, the likelihood is you would take it, you would take it every day, you wouldn't wa waver from the, the protocol, uh, and you would value a remission. Type 2 diabetes has a 50% 10 year survival. Now, these figures, of course, are adjusted for age. Um, they're all found in, in older people. It tells us that type 2 diabetes is at least on a par with major cancers, and we should be looking for treatments with a similar sort of seriousness to the to what we would give to treatment for a cancer. The difficulty is that type 2 diabetes is not a cancer. We don't have a chemotherapy. If we had a chemotherapy, I think 100% of our patients would take it very seriously and would value remission. The, the remission, though, comes from a completely different approach and something we must now reevaluate. We've known for many, many years that type 2 diabetes only occurs in people who become overweight. You don't need to become very overweight. And there's often a misunderstanding now uh, that people who are only a very little bit overweight can actually start developing type 2 diabetes if their genes and their family histories uh, put them at high risk. We've also known for many years that losing quite modest amounts of weight, we're looking here at um, four to eight kilograms weight loss, can um, remove the risk and prevent progression of pre-diabetes into diabetes. So overweight is causing this disease. Losing a little weight prevents that progression. We've known that uh, from repeated studies all over the world. We've also been told by our surgical colleagues that losing weight through bariatric surgery will get rid of diabetes completely. They use the word cure. Uh, in point of fact, it isn't a complete cure. As you can see here, these are four different studies of surgical uh, treatments, uh, bariatric surgery treatments for people with type 2 diabetes. In the blue columns 
are the remission rates at two years for all these studies. And you can see they run from 72, 75, 68, and 85 percent remission rates. And that means a remission no longer requiring treatment, no longer diabetic using diagnostic criteria. You can also see that for longer follow up in the green columns up to 10 years, those remission rates um, decline, which tells us that it's not a cure. Um, it doesn't last forever, but it can last for a good number of years for many people. Um, this gives us hope um, that we can turn this disease around in other ways. Surgeons, of course, aim for massive weight losses with, unfortunately, quite a lot of complications for people who, who do go through that. John Dixon over in Melbourne did the first randomized control trial. And from that, he concluded, and the data are quite clear from a quite a small study, you don't need to lose massive amounts of weight. 15 kilograms was enough to remove 83% of his patients from type 2 diabetes within two years. So 15 kilograms becomes a target for management. And that takes me back to a very old study published from Scotland um, in 1990, where we looked at people with type 2 diabetes who are overweight, who all in those days, everyone went to a dietitian every time they came to the clinic. Um, and the dietitians were pretty fierce. Many of them did lose weight, they didn't enjoy it. And the question was, does that weight loss actually improve matters for people with type 2 diabetes? This paper told us. Yes, it absolutely does. The longer, the, mo the, the more weight they lost in the first year of treatment, the longer they lived. <clears throat> and you can see from this that um, if they lost zero weight at the, um, the left-hand side of the graph, then they, they lost approximately seven years of life. And that figure in 1990 is actually the same today. Uh, we have a different profile of patients, but they're still losing six or seven years of life despite our treatments. If they lost weight, they, they gained life years to the point where with 14 or 15 kilograms weight loss, they were living as long as people who never had type 2 diabetes. That suggests that we have actually turned around the disease process of, of type 2 diabetes uh, by introducing quite major weight loss early in the course of the disease. This is in the first year of treatment. So can we put this into place prospectively? And that was where uh, repeated applications for funding were met with um, dismay and um, a failure to believe that we could achieve remissions or that we would even recruit people willing to give this a go. Diet was considered to be so difficult and so unpleasant that people wouldn't do it. Uh, Diabetes UK finally um, agreed to put me um, in, in Glasgow and my friend and colleague Roy Taylor uh, in uh, Newcastle together and gave us not just a research grant, but a strategic research initiative to test this question. And the reason for that was that they had done a survey, the James Lind survey, asking people with type 2 diabetes, what did they think research funds should be spent on? And the top priority was research to try to get a cure or remission of type 2 diabetes. They don't like having diabetes. It, it is a dreadful disease, as bad as many cancers. And our aim was bold and brave, not just to improve hemoglobin A1C, but to actually get patients into remission. So this was the first trial ever to have set up with the primary aim. The primary outcome was going to be remissions of type 2 diabetes by dietary weight loss. It was conducted entirely in primary care um, using the model, which is on the slide. We chose very typical patients. We wanted them to be very representative of the people with diabetes who are being managed in primary care across the United Kingdom. So we took people up to six years from diagnosis, a pretty wide window to start early treatment, six years, um, mean age of 54, hemoglobin A1C, 55 millimoles per mole, that's 7.5%, um, and a body mass index in this population, about 35 kilograms per meter square. They were seen in primary care. They were managed entirely by a practice nurse or a dietitian if one was available, who had, as practitioners, been trained to deliver, deliver this program by the, uh, the team from Counterweight, which was the name of the, the overall diet program. Now, the radical thing, most radical thing we did was to say on day one, we want these patients, all of them, to stop all their anti-diabetes medication and all their anti-hypertensive medications at baseline. There were really two reasons for that. One was safety. We did not want hypoglycemia or postural hypertension, which are very common complications of, of major weight loss, uh, rapid weight loss. And secondly, we know that our patients don't like taking medications and would value the chance to stop taking them. In other words, it would, it would motivate them to stay on the program. 
Of course, we did have a protocol based on guidelines to reintroduce these drugs if required. They then went on to a phase which we've called total diet replacement, and that term is now being well used, for 12 weeks. Notionally 12 weeks, some people had holidays or breaks and had to extend it, but 12 weeks, period when they ate no normal meals with their family, did not go and have a, a, a nice um, flat white uh, down the road, did not have a nice bottle of uh, wine, if that's what they like. Um, they, this was a very strict program, having soups and shakes, a formula diet, all the vitamins, minerals in place so it's entirely safe for three months. And during that three months, they were then seen um, by the practice nurse or dietitian who then coached them, guided them with a workbook towards the point when they would then start to choose foods um, to return onto food eating, not their old food eating, which had generated their weight gain and obesity and type two diabetes, but a food reintroduction program, which would then lead them to a new type of diet for weight loss maintenance and the maintenance of, of uh, remission. So we're looking at a period of quite um, brisk weight loss with 830 calories a day of formula diet to induce remissions, and then a long period of supported maintenance of remissions up to two years. And in point of fact, we've given very limited support further on up to five years in this trial, uh, but it, the, the two year was the randomized control phase. Um, the study was uh, powered, as I say, to, to look for remissions of diabetes, um, a target which had never been uh, addressed in as a primary outcome of research previously. And we aimed to, uh, to try to achieve a target of 22% of remissions in our intervention group. We assumed the control group would have about 5% remissions. Um, the reason we picked 22% was firstly, that the public health fraternity said, if you can get above 20% remissions, from a dietary intervention, we are going to have to change our whole approach to managing this disease. Secondly, um, the look ahead trial did report remissions in type two diabetes from a very expensive, very high intensity uh, program in the United States. Uh, and they got 11% remissions. So we said, anything Americans can do, we can do twice as well in Scotland. 22% was our target. Um, and to do that with power of 90%, we required a sample size of 280 patients. And I should mention that by remission, we are sticking to a, now a very conventional um, definition. Hemoglobin A1C no longer in the diabetes range below the diagnostic threshold and off all diabetes medications in this case for 12 months and up to 24 months for the data I'm going to show you. Um, so that was the power of it. And what we actually got, and many people know this, was dramatically better results than had been anticipated really by anybody, including ourselves. So the uh, control group did have uh, a few remissions, 4% at, at one year. And remember, this, this study was powered for one year outcomes. The intervention group, 46%, almost half of them who entered the trial, and this is according everybody who dropped out or fell by the wayside as being not achieving remission. So we counted for every patient in the intervention group, all 149 of them. Um, 46% in remission, no longer requiring medication, no longer diabetic one year. And the figure then fell, and this is important to, to note that it did fall between one and two years to 36%, but still well above the target we set at 12 months. So 36%, over a third of them, no longer diabetic, no longer requiring medication in the intervention group. Um, we can look at this um, also by degree of weight loss, because it, it turns out that by far and away the most important predictor of remission was weight loss, and the predictor of maintaining that remission for the second year was to maintain that weight loss. So, and this, this slide shows in blue the results at one year, in yellow the results at two years, and you can see that, um, interestingly, quite modest weight losses of five to 10 percent, or five to 10 kilograms, they're approximately 100 kilos. Um, so we have almost a third of the patients are remission for both one and two years. These are people who are very really close to the 10 uh, kilograms or 10% weight losses, but still relatively modest weight losses. If we go up to the 10 to 15 kilograms, 10 to 15% weight losses, you're looking at approximately 60% remissions maintained for two years. And then up at the top end, um, we can see that over 15 kilograms weight loss, that is giving 86% remissions um, at one year, 70% at two years. Now you would think, oh, well, it's declining over the second year. The reason for that is that this analysis used all participants, including those in the control group, some of whom lost weight to get 15 kilograms weight loss, 
um, in the second year because they had other medical problems. They were actually not losing weight intentionally. If we then look just at the, uh, I can tell you that, uh, to add to that, that approximately two thirds of the patients who lost more than 10 kilograms were in remission for two years. Uh, if you look only at the intervention group here, um, so we're looking principally at intentional weight loss in, in this case, and look at this just top, top right-hand column with 15 kilograms weight loss, 86%, the figure I showed in the last slide, achieved remissions at one year, 82% at two years. So if people were able to maintain that weight loss of 15 kilograms, they're still maintaining over 80% remissions for two years. Um, and the same sort of figures uh, apply here for the 10 to 15 kilograms, where actually it was even better at, at uh, two years. Uh, so very high remission rates for people who can maintain a weight loss of, let's say, greater than 10 kilograms for two years. Um, we, in, in direct, we also looked very carefully at blood pressure. And the reason for that was there was a lot of uncertainty about um, our decision to stop antihypertensive medications during weight loss. And I think this is largely because doctors are not familiar with uh, weight loss, or certainly not uh, substantial weight loss, as a very potent treatment for hypertension. Um, and this slide shows, firstly, in the white line at the bottom, the, the blood pressure changes from baseline um, as people went through the first few weeks of um, total diet replacement and entered into weight loss maintenance. And you can see their blood pressures fell briskly over the first two or three four visits, um, and then were maintained at approximately a level uh, that ended up 10 millimeters below baseline. So there's a brisk fall in blood pressure, and that's why we're concerned if people are also taking antihypertensive drugs in um, postural hypertension. It's a, a considerable clinical problem. For the patients who had been treated with antihypertensive drugs, um, we have uh, the green line, which is people who were on one medication, um, which was stopped, and you can see their blood pressures did not go up. They actually fell consistently um, to end up at the same place as those um, who'd never been treated for anti with antihypertensive drugs. In the yellow line, people who were on two or more drugs for their hypertension all were stopped at baseline. And you can see, again, there was no significant rise in blood pressure um, at any point. And as the trial went on, their weight, their, their blood pressures also fell. Now, <clears throat> part of that is because we did have a protocol to reintroduce medication, and that was necessary for about a third of the patients uh, with a mean of about just over a month, 42 days. So the, the point of showing the slide is to show that the protocol we used, stopping antihypertensive medications on day one, and then reintroducing if the blood pressure tended to rise, was entirely safe, avoided postural hypertension, and ended up with blood pressures substantially, substantially below baseline for everybody. If I then fly through the sort of secondary outcomes that we measured indirect, these are results at 24 months, so two years compared to control. There was a lower weight. By that stage, the mean weight loss was eight kilograms compared to controls. Um, there was a lower hemoglobin A1C with fewer on medication, as pointed out. There was a lower blood pressure with fewer on medication. There were reduced cardiovascular risk. The Q risk, which is the 10 year risk of an, an event, was actually halved the patients who were in remission, all their risk factors got better. Um, there were lower medical care costs, substantially lower medical care costs, in, even in the first year and certainly in the second year of direct. Um, these did not, they, there was a cost to, to giving the program, of course, at the beginning, but they were offset by the reduced medical care costs. There were fewer drugs prescribed. There were fewer serious adverse events, uh, significantly fewer in the second year. There were fewer consultations, there were fewer visits to hospital, et cetera, in the intervention group than in the control group. And not surprisingly, quality of life got better. And I think this is really important. Most studies of weight loss um, uh, do report some modest improvement in quality of life, but clearly it is not sufficient because the patients by and large go back to eating the way they were and put the weight back on. Indirect, we had a substantial improvement in quality of life. And I think it's telling us that losing 10 or 15 kilograms really does make a big change in people's lives. They get a life back, quality of life really does improve. A big message there. Now, I've been very quiet about my colleague, Roy Taylor, um, whose son is up in Wellington, busily being a doctor there. Um, and part of the study was that we, we pulled, pulled our forces together for Roy to do some very complicated and sophisticated metabolic measurements and scanning 
in uh, the, a subsample who was in, uh, in Tyneside in Newcastle. And what he was able to show was to confirm his earlier work in a very, very small study, uh, mechanistic studies, to show that people with type 2 diabetes at baseline had very high liver fat levels, that these levels fell substantially in the blue columns here in people who were uh, responders to the treatment who, who became non-diabetic, um, but did not fall in those who did not respond, who remained diabetic, and did not fall in those who relapsed back into diabetes. So liver fat is innately linked to the diabetic type 2 diabetes status. Get rid of the liver fat, you get rid of the diabetes. And that's partly because the fat export from the liver, VLDL, follows that pattern, falls in the patients who are getting remission, did not fall and even increased in patients who are having relapses of diabetes. And it's seen also in the pancreas. So this, the scanning of the pancreas was able to show that um, the pancreas was fatty in people with type 2 diabetes. And that fat was reduced substantially to normal in people who became who, who had remissions, whereas it remained fatty in those who had uh, who did not get remissions and in those who relapsed. And of course, those are the categories where there was not sufficient weight loss in the main. Um, so very clever studies showing um, how, how the, the pattern of type 2 diabetes is actually driven by excess fat, ectopic fat in vital organs, the liver, the pancreas, and of course in the heart and in other organs that our treatment was able, in those who were able to get remission, remove that ectopic fat. And this is the ectopic fat, which is impairing organ functions. This slide um, is from a much more recent paper published just a few weeks ago, where uh, it presents the actual morphology, the shape and, and texture of the pancreas gland itself. It's a very difficult gland to, to examine. And at the top, you can see some photos of it. Um, they've been categorized by volume. And you can see that at baseline, pancreas has a low volume. The dotted blue lines here represent normal people who, who don't have diabetes. So the pancreas is about half the normal size volume at a baseline. And those who achieve remissions, it returned to its normal volume, and that's manifest in the photographs. It also, they also measured the raggedness, the, uh, this is a, the fractile dimension of the pancreas, the, the raggedness of the shape of it. And you can see it was very ragged at baseline in these people with type 2 diabetes. Those who achieve remissions, it returned to normal. And this correlated very closely with the measured return to maximal insulin secretion. So the pancreas organ is fatty at baseline, it's ragged, it's misshapen, it loses volume, it loses capacity to make insulin with weight loss. That was the only intervention we gave them was weight loss by diet. Uh, all that was restored in those who achieved emissions. This is telling us that the, the, there is a much deeper understanding to type 2 diabetes than we previously perhaps understood. And I've shown it here sort of at a population level. On the left, about 60% of most populations do not have the predisposition of the genes for metabolic syndrome. So if you're amongst that 60%, you're lucky. You can, as you grow older, you can gain weight and show really quite little risk of, of heart disease. So the relationship between uh, weight gain and heart disease is relatively minor in these people, 60%, who do not have the the metabolic syndrome genes. Um, and that's probably been well shown by many studies over many years. That there's not a very powerful link between obesity and heart disease. However, if you are in the 40%, and we know it's about 40%, at least in North America and in Europe, who do have that genetic predisposition, who will, as, as they grow older, if they put on weight, um, show metabolic syndrome, that 40%, if they gain weight, yes, they, um, I, they, they, they gain their they develop diabetes, they develop hypertension, dyslipidemia, and a number of associated features. These people are at very high risk of macrovascular disease, and that risk starts as, as you go into the pre-diabetic range. They are then also at high risk of microvascular disease, and that is associated with diabetes once it's in the diabetes range of hemoglobin A1c and clinical manifestations of that. So we can, if, if we had these genes easily identifiable, and of course there are many people looking for them, particularly people in, in Cambridge, um, then we would be able to say, you perhaps are rather less risk of gaining uh, metabolic disease uh, if you gain weight, and you unfortunately are at very high risk. And what we've shown in direct is that we can do this very simple thing of reversing that whole process. Um, to, to take away that ectopic fat, to take away the type two diabetes and the hypertension and return people with weight loss to a much healthier um, metabolic state. Now, the direct trial 
is, as I mentioned, was the only, it was the first one to, to look at um, remission as a primary outcome. It was uh, repeated almost exactly by, by a very, very similar study in, in Qatar um, by Shahrad Tahiri and colleagues, published just um, earlier this year. Um, and they showed very similar weight loss, 12 kilograms compared on average to 10 kilograms in, in direct uh, at one year. And their remission rate was even higher than in direct, 61% of the intervention group got remissions. Slightly smaller study, but nonetheless, um, uh, very impressive remission rates. And in their usual care group, 12% uh, remission rates compared to 4% indirect. And this is important because what they did was to select patients within two years of diagnosis. So much earlier in the disease course. And also there were people from um, uh, Arab and North African origins. So possibly these were people were a little bit more like Asians who were more susceptible to weight gain, more uh, responsive to weight loss. And I just put on this slide also two other studies which people quote in this context. Firstly, there's a, a study by someone called Vertra Health, which is a commercial company in the United States who promote low carbohydrate diets. They have published and promote a study which was not a randomized control trial, uh, but they used a um, what they call a, a ketogenic, very low carbohydrate diet. They had very good weight losses, um, which is impressive, and you would expect that to produce quite high remission rates. They actually only reported, um, the, the study is very difficult to interpret. It, it actually looks like 19% remission rates, but if you're a little bit flexible with, with how they describe it, it might be 26%, certainly not remotely as high as we found in direct or in Diadem 1. Um, and the look-ahead trial I mentioned already uh, was not a um, study looking at remissions in particular. They got 8% weight losses and a remission rate of 11%, which is probably what you would expect from a weight management trial. So early days, we have very consistent data showing that weight loss does produce remissions of diabetes and direct has shown they can be sustained up to two years. We hope very soon to have much longer data on our, our patients. Um, but it looks as if we, we have kind of turned around the, our understanding of this disease. And just to give you some summary, the first thing, message here is that we really must treat type 2 diabetes much, much more seriously on a par with a cancer. And we mustn't beat about the bush with our patients. They must understand this is a very serious disease and they need to take its treatment, its management and aim for remission uh, very, very seriously. Secondly, we have actually got now a program. Uh, it's, it's not magic. It is clearly not going to be the, the last word, but it's actually giving us really very good results with a weight loss of about 15 kilograms in Europeans. It may be, and we're, we're, we're suspicious that you could actually get similar results with lesser weight loss amongst patients, and that needs to be confirmed. And we're also now, of course, already looking for better ways to put this program into place for, for implementation. We're looking at novel dietary strategies, and it might be that using the low-carb approach will, will be valuable perhaps not at extreme levels, adding five, to, this is mainly for the weight loss maintenance phase, five, two diets or time restricted eating. We might have to consider for patients unsuccessful with diet alone, the use of um, the newer agents to, uh, to maintain the weight loss, not so much to, to induce weight loss, but to maintain long-term um, remissions. And we're interested in food supplements now, which can uh, increase endogenous GLP-1 and reduce the drive to eat appetite. Uh, to maintain weight loss better. So, uh, and uh, perhaps I should add to that, of course, now with the, um, the post or not even post COVID world that we have in, in Europe, we are now well aware that we need to be able to deliver interventions remotely. We need to be able to fo follow up and maintain our patients uh, remotely as they achieve and then maintain remissions of diabetes. Um, our research has used formula diets, but I will point out very quickly that it isn't necessary to use a formula diet. Many of our patients have achieved similar weight losses and success using food-based approaches. And the first one I'll show is, of course, very traditional foods can be exactly perfect for this type of approach. And here's a, a, a Nepali meal. Uh, it's dal bat. It's very typical. It's everybody in Nepal enjoys this. They have a terrible problem with diabetes, not because they eat too much dal bat. It's because they've introduced a lot of Western foods. Um, and if they were to return to a much more traditional diet along these lines, we've done some pilot studies in, in Nepal showing that we can get people to lose weight and to achieve remissions of diabetes using very traditional diets. And that's a message all around the world. All, all, nearly all traditional diets have been associated with lower weight and less diabetes. 
And we've even done that in Scotland. And if anybody is interested in, in our slightly tongue-in-cheek Scottish approach, it's called the New Doubts Diet. It's based on porridge and lentil soup. There it is, up on the website, um, uh, directclinicaltrial.org.uk. And I'll give you a massive thank you um, as, as an audience. I'll return to my Kiwi audience. Um, we have many thanks for getting the direct trial off the ground. The biggest thank you goes to Diabetes UK, who had the courage uh, and produced the funding to make it work. Um, and I have to thank the donors. This is all from people who just gave money willingly to um, make our research possible uh, to benefit people with type 2 diabetes. And on that happy note, I'll say thank you very much for listening, if you did, um, and wish you well for Diabetes um, World Diabetes Month, or as I prefer to say, World No Diabetes Month, and I think it should be the, the cry for the future. Thank you very much indeed.